Okay, hello. Uh, this is Cyber Protection Magazine, and uh, with us today is uh, Bensi Benata from uh, CPO Systems, uh, who already had an article in Cyber Protection Magazine uh, about uh, the question whether you are a rebel or a collector, uh, CISO. Um, and uh, Bensi, maybe uh, can you introduce yourself? And as a first question, um, what was the message uh, behind that particular article? It was a very good article. I liked reading it a lot, by the way. Great. So first of all, thank you very much uh, for this uh, for this opportunity. Um, I'm one of the co-founders for Cepio Systems. Cepio Systems is uh, a company founded by a, a core group of founders that we've been working together for almost uh, 30 years now. Uh, with a strong army Intel background, uh, serving together in 8200. Um, Sepio System is actually our third company together, where the first two were successfully acquired by NASDAQ traded companies. And Sepio System now deals with the issue of hardware access control. And when we, when we approach uh, or, or carry the message of something that is uh, a kind of an evangelizing idea, then uh, usually you would get a lot of uh, a, pushbacks from various audiences. And, and my article actually is a summary of the pushbacks and the types of CISOs that I've encountered in the last uh, five years. And uh, as, as I categorized them, so there were the, what we call the early adopters or the, the rebels, uh, which actually understand, truly understand the concept of, of security. Uh, in some cases, they are more likely to think as, uh, as criminals. So. Uh, they are more tapped into the criminal aspects of, uh, of cyber crime and, uh, and state-sponsored activities. And they will be the first to jump in on, uh, on new technologies, understanding that there is a, a, a strong need to be up to date with the latest technology and understanding that attackers uh, live among us. So uh, they are actually fully aware of all the cyber, the great cybersecurity products that are out there. And uh, once they know that, they will actually go and, and find ways to outsmart those uh, solutions or find ways to bypass them. Because eventually, even those cyber crime organization or state-sponsored uh, um, activists uh, are still human beings. They want to do well. They don't want to fail. They don't want their attack tools to be revealed. Uh, so uh, trying to... Um, it, to promote their use of, uh, of hardware-based uh, uh, tools is something that we need to bring into the uh, knowledge of the general uh, general public. So there are CISOs that completely understand that. Uh, in some cases, they have some strong army intel background or agency background because uh, years back, this was what we call the, the kind of a James Bond domain of, uh, of activities. And uh, if you recall, there was the and catalog for leaked from the NSA that included a variety of hardware-based uh, attack tools. And uh, on top of those CISO, there's the, the kind of a Me Too CISO. They're still, uh, still independent, but they are not uh, evangelizing and, and, and rebels like the first type. So uh, they, will, they will listen, they will understand in open mind, uh, but they will not drive the the process by themselves. They will wait to see if someone else is, uh, is adopting that uh, paradigm or that uh, workbook or, or, or solution. And once they, they get that recommendation from, uh, from someone who already did that, which in most cases, the rebel CISOs are highly valued, then they will, uh, they will do a kind of a me too and uh, implement the same solution. And the third type of CISO, which uh, in most of actually the majority uh, um, because obviously there's a, a numerous number of, of companies, so all, not all can be rebels, are uh, CISOs uh, that uh, actually you know, do a cut and paste to the overall uh, cybersecurity posture of, uh, of organization that they, that they impersonate or mimic. And as the, the, you know, the years back cliche said, saying that you know, no one got fired for, for buying IBM, so it's very similar uh, even today when you uh, when you follow what we call the kind of a best practice. So uh, certain type of uh, security products from uh, very identifiable vendors. Uh, obviously, there are a lot of them, but they are all identified and keeping it uh, safe uh, and uh, trying to copycat the what the others are doing. And obviously, these type of companies will be disadvantaged compared where. 
uh, with other uh, leading uh, CISOs. Okay, and then uh, I can I can just uh, recommend for everyone to uh, dig into the article, which is uh, published on a magazine. Um, but you already mentioned uh, hardware-based attacks, which should be uh, more public. Uh, people need to know about it. So, what are what kind of hardware-based attacks are we talking about, and how often do they actually happen? Okay, so hardware-based attacks are attacks that are carried out. Uh, usually by a, a manipulated hardware or manipulated firmware. Uh, and they, will, they would usually be introduced into the enterprise by internal abuser or supply chain attacks. Now, in some cases, the, the attack tools themselves are actually devices that you buy in the open market for a, for a legitimate purpose. But these devices have a, an inherent uh, vulnerability that once an attacker is aware of the existence of this hardware device within your infrastructure, they could use that device for their benefit as their attack platform. So in some cases, you don't even have to have a physical interface or physical access to the site itself as you can use the existing infrastructure uh, vulnerabilities, hardware vulnerabilities to your advantage. Now, usually hardware attack tools uh, will carry their attack by either implanted by, by being implanted into a, a legitimate device or replacing a legitimate device or by spoofing a legitimate device and doing that in very specific layers of the, of the kind of OSI layer model, which makes them completely invisible to existing uh, cybersecurity products. Now, the main, uh, the main reason why there's a, a kind of a awareness obstacle here is that most of the hardware-based attacks usually don't go public in contrast to uh, solo winds or those mass uh, volume type of uh, type of attacks the hardware-based attacks are usually very pinpointed into specific enterprises there could be banks there could be specific atm networks or operators critical infrastructure agencies and so on but there will be most cases very pinpointed uh, with regards to their target because there will be a complete campaign which in some cases will involve a human factor either as a, an attack vehicle or carrier of, uh, of the attack tool into the enterprise. And in most cases, the, the exact details of the attack will, no, will never be known. Uh, for some reason, uh, it, will, it could be because of uh, the reluctance of uh, enterprises to share the fact that they've been breached on this specific attack uh, surface, uh, which is uh, the which also implies on their level of physical uh, physical security, and in some cases the the forensic analysis of uh, of those uh, of those attacks in some cases will be a mistakenly identified as a phishing attack or a spear phishing attack of an employee clicking on a link that he shouldn't have while in real life. The employee didn't click on anything. It was someone spoofing his wireless uh, keyboard connection and actually typing uh, uh, on behalf of him. Okay, that's that's interesting. Um, now uh, I understand that uh, it's probably hard to pinpoint that, but um, you also mentioned that wireless keyboard could be a source of those uh, attacks. But I imagine there could also be. Um, some outdated other hardware attacks, uh, like in a, in a machinery, in a factory, there will probably be some electronic parts which have a firmware, but which hasn't been updated for literally decades. Is that uh, also a real uh, danger for companies? Yes, yes, obviously in the manufacturing industry, uh, you know, not all, everything is, uh, is up to date. Uh, we do see some even instances of uh, Windows XP still being used in some, uh, in some cases. Um, uh, so this is something that is obviously uh, there. Um, you know, companies do understand that in order to, uh, you know, to get into a better cybersecurity posture, they do need to take the effort of, of migrating into uh, a more stabilized and, and updated uh, uh, solutions. But, you know, at the end of the day, if you have a, a very unique piece of machinery that, you know, is irreplaceable, um, you know, it's a, it could be a project to replace that. So, you know, you in, in some cases, what we've seen is that uh, the customer will uh, will keep their fingers crossed and hoping that they will not be targeted. But uh, you're you're completely right. That's still, uh, especially in the OT domain, that is still an issue. Okay, and then you also mentioned that uh, 
cybersecurity or existing cybersecurity solutions will not be able to see such hardware-based attacks. So uh, why is that? And what are the main visibility gaps? What, what, what do they not see essentially? So, so the, main, um, the main challenge here is that existing cybersecurity products uh, have visibility from layer two and above. So that means that they need to uh, be aware of the fact that there's a, there's a device there and they are aware of the fact by uh, sniffing out traffic or uh, identifying a certain MAC address or, or something that is related to layer two and above. Now attackers understand that. So they've obviously, if everybody is, uh, is well covered from layer two and above, uh, then they'll uh, dive into the physical layer, into layer one, and they found a variety of tools. And it's really impressive to see how uh, overwhelming wealth of, uh, of attack tools and, and potential uh, uh, attack tools are to be found in that, uh, in that layer. And in that layer, which is kind of the, the electronics part of, uh, a, of our infrastructure, you find a variety of tools. They could be a simple passive uh, network tap with no active component, it obviously doesn't have a MAC address, uh, sitting in, in your network as an implant, uh, spoofing, uh, you know, is dropping to your traffic. And all you need to do is just uh, connect a laptop to running a Wireshark or something like that, because it's a, it's a passive tap. The, the connection of that uh, a machine endpoint running Wireshark will not be uh, revealed because it's not connected on the transmission line. So only it will be sniffing out traffic without being picked up by any existing solution. And in some cases, even if you take a, a simple unmanaged switch hub and connect it, uh, you know, even as a legitimate user uh, to you, that you want an, an, an additional RJ45 port, the fact that you've introduced a new uh, unmanaged switch hub into your uh, network is completely uh, invisible to existing solutions because they are MACless devices. They do not have any presence in layer two and above. And the other class of, uh, of devices are all those uh, spoofing devices. That means that these are devices which will, in most cases, carry a man in the middle attack. I impersonating as a legitimate, uh, as a legitimate device using obviously the same MAC address, the same uh, port setup. So for those solutions that try to identify all those kind of anomalies in the, uh, in traffic or in uh, the port mapping or in the MAC addresses or the host name, everything will be completely legitimate other than the fact that it's not a legitimate device. And the same thing happens on the, uh, on the USB side. So uh, again, we've seen uh, numerous incidents of that uh, where a USB in the middle attack was used in order to uh, fully impersonate a legitimate device or more commonly, all those uh, attacks where you impersonate as a legitimate keyboard. So you will use the same vendor ID, product ID, class ID of a legitimate keyboard, while in real life, it could be a rubber ducky device or a, a TZ or a, any sort of a Raspberry Pi payload that will be impersonating as a user. And in that case, even in, for, those, for those setups where you, uh, uh, you know, say that, you, oh, we have everything on the cloud, so we're protected, or we have a no USB policy. When you try to narrow it down, you actually understand that they've blocked all the kind of a standard devices uh, that everybody are aware of the risks, like uh, NetSticks or, uh, or mass storage devices. So these devices obviously are being very well attended by uh, device control solutions or a uh, DLP or endpoint security solutions. But when you ask them, okay, how do you type or how do you navigate through your, uh, to your cloud uh, applications or services? Then they would say, oh, we have a keyboard and a mouse and how are they connected? Then they would say USB. So for some unknown reason, there is a, a distinct differentiation between the USB that is used for keyboard and mouse and USB being used for mass storage and, uh, and then net, net sticks and other devices. And obviously you can't, deal without uh, uh, without having a keyboard or or a mouse so the the vulnerability is still there and uh, is completely invisible to uh, to all those uh, great security products that are doing a great job but from a certain layer and above yeah and uh, you mentioned it i mean you mentioned the raspberry pi a, a rubber ducky and uh, these types of devices uh, are readily available on the internet and anyone can buy them or uh, we just featured a video of the uh, USB Ninja cable, uh, which you know essentially uh, is a is a charging cable, 
uh, with a payload attached to it, so to speak. Um, so these devices are really easy to get. Um, now you mentioned hardware access control is uh, a way to prevent those kind of attacks. What what does what does hardware access control entail? So hardware access control actually deals with all aspects of uh, of accessing your uh, your hardware devices within your infrastructure. So obviously it starts with the visibility of whatever is connected, where whether it's a an IT or OT or IoT or IO medical device, everything that's connected somewhere in your enterprise, whether it's managed or unmanaged, whether it's uh, visible in, or invisible, every device should be accounted for because then only in after you know what do you have, you can decide okay how do I uh, uh, determine the risk factor for every for every device and uh, which security solution should I apply to specific uh, devices or specific sections of my uh, of my network. So once we have the visibility, then we move into the policy enforcement, which uh, actually means that you uh, decide which devices are allowed and which are not. And you can also decide which devices are allowed depending on the, the place that they are connected in. So for example, you may decide that if someone is using a certain device, but is located in the office, then you, you have the physical security, then you may decide that it's uh, safe enough. But if someone is working from home, you may decide that you want to block that device because again, you, uh, you are more concerned about the, the security aspects of, uh, of that device. So you can decide on different policies and, and enforce them uh, according to different uh, flavors of, or different sensitivity levels within your enterprise. And once you have uh, visibility and you have uh, policy enforcement, then you move into ROG device mitigation, which are the security applications of uh, actually identifying all those uh, uh, ROG devices that might be introduced by internal abuser or supply chain attacks. Okay, that sounds very similar to the zero trust concept. Is that the zero trust concept just expanded to include hardware or what's the difference? Yes, actually, if, you, if you're embracing the, the zero trust uh, uh, architecture and, and, and concept, then obviously hardware access control is a, uh, is, is a key player in that because one of the things there is that you, you need to verify that on the device uh, identification, uh, you need to verify that the devices are trusted. And you need to verify that they are trusted up to the physical layer because if you're going to use a certain uh, a certain keyboard or a certain uh, point of sale or a certain ATM or a certain server or machine, you need to verify up to the physical layer that the device that you think you're connected to is the actual device that you're connected to. So it's not just about you know user trust, but obviously device uh, identification and verification, and the fact that you know the the risk scoring for the devices is also a, a a key part in, in that zero trust uh, embracement uh, is something that is also important, how risky a certain device is. And when you do it, deploy or, or adopt the, the hardware, uh, what we call the zero trust access, uh, um, hardware access, then this is something that provides you with the, with the complete assurance that, the, that you not only assure and trust the users, but you can also rely on the fact and trust the devices that you're actually using. Okay. Um, now, if we talk about rogue devices, uh, it, I think from 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 what I understand, I'm, I'm just thinking back to, um, not sure when it was. I think two years ago, uh, when it was discovered that apparently there were some rogue chips manufactured onto a mainboard uh, coming from China. Um, and I think uh, the United States, uh, they actually um, have a directive, uh, Section 889 Part B, uh, which uh, is at least for federal uh, organizations is uh, something which they uh, should take note of or should, should comply to. Um, is there a difference if something is baked into a le legitimate device or um, uh, does it need to be a separate rogue device? Okay, so um, with regards to um, a, what is referred to as supply chain, a supply chain attacks on the hardware domain, there is actually uh, a various variants to uh, or flavors to that. There is what we call the hardcore hardware a, a supply chain attacks, which means that given enough resources, uh, one can actually um, 
generate or or manufacture uh, a chip that will uh, uh, that will be identical to a legitimate chip but will have an additional functionality that may be might be triggered by an external trigger by the by the operator and uh, again you can go back to uh, what was uh, back then leaked on the uh, ant catalog and you see the very same plants there and you understand that if this is something that it was available, uh, let's say, 15 or 20 years ago. And obviously, technology has extremely progressed since that. So you can uh, extrapolate and understand what are the capabilities that uh, one uh, has today. But this is for the what we call the hardcore supply chain attacks, which is uh, a, something that is more attributed to state-sponsored activities. On the other side of the equation, there is what we call the a lighter touch of uh, supply chain attacks where you you unbox a, a, a switch or a server or a, or a keyboard or a mouse and you implant it with an external uh, with an external device which could be a raspberry pi zero or a, a certain arduino a mini board or a digispark board or things that you add on to the existing uh, uh, to the existing uh, hardware by uh, you know opening up a box in a warehouse or intercepting a courier and, uh, and doing it uh, uh, during shipment. Uh, but these will be usually uh, devices that will be bought in the open market. So it won't be a, a, you know agency grade or, or military grade a type of solution, but that also has the benefits, but that if you're using an off the shelf device, then uh, we what, there is what we say, there's no there's no accountability because uh, there is lacking traceability. Because if you're using a Raspberry Pi th uh, that was used by millions or sold by millions, then you're using a, a mouse or a keyboard that was sold by the millions. Uh, you know, it's it's much more difficult to uh, to understand the origin of the attacks compared with uh, you know having a very customized piece of hardware uh, that might say that it was made in X or made in Y. Uh, you know, uh, cynically saying. That's uh, I, I, I just want to get into the the, the hardcore uh, attack, as you say, because there have been some discussions recently, uh, I think in most countries uh, about the 5G technology and uh, seeing that uh, Huawei is one of the uh, or the leading um, provider of 5G technology from the from the back end from the from the network. Um, a lot of uh, countries, including the US, were afraid that this might be uh, used or uh, misused um, to maybe activate one of these chips. Is that, first of all, is that a real danger? And would hardware access control be able to prevent that? I, I think that the fact that, uh, again, certain countries, and it's not just the US, certain countries have, uh, have adopted the, the clean network and, and adapted, uh, adopted certain uh, regulations or or restriction upon uh, uh, certain uh, some certain countries means that uh, they believe that it is a it is a feasible uh, it is a feasible risk and again going back into the to the origin of uh, of the word trojan so uh, you know in order to get into troy then you know that was heavily fortified the way to give it is to, uh, to get something that will be delivered and be accepted by uh, by the defenders. So in this case, obviously, if you're uh, if you're buying a piece of equipment and, and accepting that, and uh, someone implanted that uh, that piece of equipment, then obviously they're they're well in, and it is it would be extremely difficult um, to identify these type of uh, these type of attacks. And I think that because of that, the the more easy way to handle it is to completely, uh, you know, prohibit the the use of uh, of those uh, of those devices. Technology speaking, obviously, you can uh, you can do a lot of uh, a lot of damage. And if uh, if you're a skilled attacker, then obviously you always need to assume that the the potential attacker is smart. Um, it will be almost uh, impossible to to detect that, or it will require extremely uh, significant uh, resources uh, for uh, for handling this. Uh, so the easiest way would be to uh, you know to ban all these type of equipments and you know try to uh, to tackle the risks on a on a different layer. And then maybe go into the because this this is obviously a very um, 
particular um, uh, type of attack and it needs to be state sponsored. Uh, but if we uh, look at the other side, so as you said, maybe um, implementing a or implanting a, a Raspberry Pi into a regular switch or something like that, that is easier done by attackers uh, than the other type of uh, uh, attack. Um, how, um, how can that be discovered? Uh, and maybe um, when we talk about hardware access control, uh, and specifically of what you're offering with the CPU systems, um, how, do, how do you make that from a technology point of view? What, what, what is your technology like? So uh, our main uh, our main differentiator is, is the fact that we we go deeper uh, layer wise. So that means that we actually analyze the physical layer characteristics of the of the network. So that means that we we do not uh, look into traffic, we do not look into user log files or anything like that. We look into the actual physical characteristics of a of a certain uh, of a certain connection, um, and these physical characteristics, happily enough, are uh, it can be uh, in most cases can be fingerprinted. So we could actually uh, attribute a certain fingerprinting vector that we generate from all those uh, hardware layer information that we get from uh, from the switches, and we can actually build a vector and then. Uh, we can actually identify in a, in a very accurate way if the device is what, is what it says it is or if it's something, uh, something different. Uh, so we use, uh, we use that technology. And uh, this is a very unique uh, patent pending uh, technology for actually doing the analysis on the physical layer. And one of the key cool features of, uh, of this implementation is that it doesn't require a baseline or a training period because it doesn't rely on, on kind of an anomality detection. That means that even if the spoof device or the implant was already in place before a solution was deployed, uh, we will still be able to detect that. So that, that makes the operational aspect of it very, uh, very friendly because you don't need to assume a, a hygiene cyber environment. And the solution itself is a software-based uh, software solution that can be installed as a, an on-prem solution or as a, or as a SAF. Um, you know, we guarantee that within 24 hours, uh, everything will be up and running. It's not, a, it's not a project, it's a very straightforward installation process that we, that we uh, accompany. And uh, once, you, uh, once you have the solution deployed, you know, uh, three minutes later, uh, you'll get the full asset uh, inventory of whatever is connected all the legitimate devices, all the spoofing devices, all the risky devices, everything will be laid before you, including what uh, we also have as a, a, our own threat intelligence database. So that means that if someone connected a known to be vulnerable device, it could be a legitimate device without any malicious uh, intent in purchasing it or, in, or, or deploying it, but someone accidentally bought a device without knowing that this device has a known vulnerability, Instead of the customer chasing all those uh, databases of various devices, we do that for him. And should that device uh, be connected somewhere in the enterprise, we'll alert on that as well. That's uh, okay. That's very, very, very interesting. And uh, uh, honestly, um, I haven't thought about hardware-based attacks uh, so much uh, before we've had this uh, this conversation today. Uh, but uh, I'm sure, and uh, I hope that uh, with, with your support, possibly, uh, we will definitely hear more about that. Um, uh, it's definitely something I, will, I want to chase up uh, because uh, I know that I know how easy it is to uh, get these kind of devices. I mean, you mentioned the rubber ducky or the, there's the, um, what's it called? Um, the man in the middle wireless uh, um, uh, device, uh, I can't remember what, 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 what's it called. Um, anyway, but you know, these, these types of devices, Raspberry Pi Zero, you can get anywhere. It's pretty cheap and uh, it's also pretty uh, easy to program. Um, so uh, yeah, hardware-based attack, very interesting topic. Definitely something uh, which will we uh, deep dive into. Um, and yeah, um, thanks Bensi for that uh, uh, very good insight today. Thank you very much, Patrick.